From the station that's on your side, you're watching News 19 at 7. Tonight, the Midlands is remembering the Reverend Billy Graham. Over the next half an hour, we'll be taking a look at his life, his impact, and most importantly, the message he spread throughout the world. Good evening now. Up first tonight, our Darcy Strickland. She looks back at the life and legacy of America's pastor. And Jesus is saying to us in 1969, take up your cross, deny self, follow me, and we can change the world. For decades, Reverend Billy Graham stood delivering that message of changing the world through Christ. His Evangelistic Association estimates he preached before nearly 215 million people in more than 185 countries. Christ belongs to all people. He belongs to the whole world. The verse that he often said drove him to minister to the masses. Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Those of us in the Carolinas could relate to Graham and how he grew up. He was born November 7, 1918, and spent much of his time growing up on a dairy farm in Charlotte. At the age of 15, he committed his life to Jesus while hearing a traveling evangelist at a revival. Christ came into my life, transformed me, changed me, made me a new person. I've seen him change thousands of lives. Graham took the revival-style ministry across the world. His massive crusades witnessed to thousands for days at a time and sometimes longer, 12 weeks in London and 16 weeks at Madison Square Garden. And the only time that you have total peace is when you're totally committed and totally yielded in every phase of your life to Christ. In 1939, a church in the Southern Baptist Convention ordained Graham, and that same year he married the daughter of a missionary, Ruth McHugh Bell. The two would spend their time together spreading the gospel. Presidents often found comfort and direction in Reverend Graham's words. For decades, regardless of party, Graham often ministered to presidents. During Watergate, Richard Nixon's audio recording system captured one call where the president asked Graham about the TV coverage of one of his speeches. I felt like slashing their throat. Graham served as the presiding minister over Nixon's funeral, spoke at President Bill Clinton's inauguration, and was frequently called upon by both Bushes. His library and ministry plans to continue the work from their offices in Charlotte. There is no other way. Man cannot be saved by bread alone. Graham made a long list of stops in South Carolina, holding three crusades in the Palmetto State, including one in Columbia at williams Bryce Stadium in 1987. This is a great university, one of the greatest in the country that we're on here. Dr. Holderman and his wife came and visited my wife and me for a cup of coffee this morning, and we had a wonderful time together. Billy Graham's first crusade in Columbia was way back in 1950. Another took place in Greenville in 1966. Those crusades brought hundreds together to hear his message. Jenny Wurzberger caught up with Don Smith Jordan, who shared her testimony and sang on the stage at williams Bryce Stadium. It was one of those, I think I need to pinch myself to see, am I really doing this? Am I really meeting Billy Graham? Don Smith Jordan didn't just meet Billy Graham, but the former Miss South Carolina was invited to sing and speak on stage when his crusade came to williams Bryce in 1987. Let's welcome her together. Don Smith. Isn't this crazy? <laughs> I had no idea until the day of the crusade that I would tell my story and I would sing. Wow, it is so great to be here tonight. It really is. Being Miss South Carolina has brought me so many opportunities. It was a very brief um, part of my story, but in about two minutes they had asked me to share about my um, younger sister's kidnapping and murder had taken place um, a little over a year before the crusade came to Columbia. And I asked the Lord to look after Sherry and to keep her safe and to please let her live. And I told the Lord that I could not go on if Sherry didn't live. Her sister was a part of the largest manhunt in South Carolina history. Sherry Smith was just 17 years old when she was taken from her driveway and murdered by Larry Jean Bell in 1985. Looking back, it's certainly nothing I would have ever chosen to happen, but yet I shared that night that I chose to trust in God even then and that His grace would be sufficient, which was so 
uh, appropriate that I was able to sing Amazing Grace because that is what I stood on, that the grace of God would get me through, that He'd already gotten us through a year, and that we just keep doing what Sherry said, just keep taking life one day at a time. And now I look back and go, man, that's a bunch of one days at a time. And we are okay. It didn't ruin our lives. The very nervous 22-year-old standing on stage with Reverend Billy Graham in front of thousands of people. Over the week-long crusade, 98,000 filled the Gamecock Stadium. To hear him preach live and um, to see the people come forward at the end and to just think, wow, what an opportunity. I mean, how many people get to be a part of something that huge? And now it's really funny because I'm on the um, Billy Graham Classics, <laughs> which makes me feel so old. <laughs> Dawn says over the years she has questioned her faith like anyone else, but knows opening up about her family's tragedy has given her the opportunity to inspire others for nearly 25 years. I'm really grateful because still to this day, you know, people say everywhere I travel and sing, oh, I've seen you on the Billy Graham Crusade. And um, that was something that really began to open doors for me as a professional Christian singer. Her mission work will continue and says meeting Reverend Graham has been one of the highlights of her career because he's a man who lived what he preached. I think Billy Graham will be remembered for his um, passion for the gospel of Christ. Uh, he truly is someone who has taken the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel, and that's what he's done. And so he's known to me, and I think my generation, as the greatest evangelist in our time. Jenny Wartsberger reporting tonight. Our Chuck Ringwalt has made his way to Charlotte tonight at the Billy Graham Library. He joins us live now with reaction there to the Reverend's death. Chuck. JR, a press conference is expected to start at 7.30. Well, we'll learn more details about Reverend Graham's death and details moving forward. But it was earlier today that we spoke to many visitors of the Billy Graham Library, and they told us how Reverend Graham made an impact on their life. It, it was amazing back in the day, even when I was a teenager and in my 20s, because you would see a stadium of people, and you would hear the message of God. And then all of a sudden, he would give that message to come forward to be safe. And then you just see thousands of people walking down towards the field, and you know there was a change in life. It was at a park. Um, I remember the, the commotion that Dr. Graham was going to Puerto Rico, and all the churches getting together. Like at that time, it, it didn't matter like that you were Presbyterian or that you were Lutheran. It, that it didn't matter. All the churches getting together to bring people over to that park so that people could hear about Jesus. I think his bottom line message was the aspect of all, we, we're all in a fallen world. We're all sinners, and no matter what you've done in life, his, his was a message of uplift. So that's what I always remember. And while the people we spoke with are celebrating Reverend Graham as a person, they're also celebrating the fact that he was a messenger spreading the message of Christ. And that press conference is going to start at 730, and we'll be sure to bring that to you on Facebook. But for now, reporting live in Charlotte, Chuck Ringwald, News 19, WLTX. Chuck, thanks. Up next, more local stories from those whose lives were touched by the Reverend Billy Graham. You say, why do you ask us to come forward publicly like that? That's one thing I don't understand. Because every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. And he said, if you're not willing to confess me before men, I'll not confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. Tonight, local spiritual leaders across the Midlands are speaking out about their experiences with the Reverend Billy Graham. Steve Phillips is the Minister of Music at Columbia's First Baptist Church. During his youth, he had the opportunity to spend some time with the Reverend. Here's Darcy Strickland tonight. That was from the Billy Graham Crusade in Houston, Texas in 1981. Steve Phillips has had the pleasure of seeing Billy Graham up close and personal on more than one occasion. We were all there in the bottom of Lookup Lodge and we had a little morning service and Billy Graham 
preached for the morning service, brought the devotion for us that morning. And, and being a young person, that was very impressionistic on me. His relationship with this evangelical great made possible by a family friend affectionately referred to as Uncle Cliff. My connection to Billy Graham is really Cliff Barrows. I heard Billy Graham say one time he was the cog in the middle of the wheel that helped the whole things together. Because of his family's close relationship with Barrows, Phillips found himself in places some could only hope to be. Cliff Barrows and Billy Graham, and then you can see my little head peeking back over, peeking back over the way there at, the, at First Baptist Church, Dallas. That's in uh, the Portland Crusade in 1950 in a literal tabernacle there. And you can see Cliff Barrows leading the choir as they're practicing. Barrows was the longtime music and program director for the Billy Graham Association. He passed away in 2016. Barrows is best known as the host of Graham's weekly Hour of Decision radio program and the song leader and choir director so for the Crusade the meetings. Account. Leadership secrets of uh, Billy Graham. And this talks about Cliff Barrows in there. Right. And I remember hearing Billy Graham uh, say some words at the Barrows 25th wedding anniversary at their house in Greenville. Phillips reflects on the fact that the relationship Graham and Barrows shared was built on a mutual respect and belief in God's divine calling. Cliff Barrows, Billy Graham, George Beverly Shea, none of them thought anything about themselves. They're the most humble, Christ-like people you would ever want to meet. One night, Billy Graham called to check on, uh, check on Uncle Cliff and Daddy said that Billy Graham just talked practically nonstop to him for 45 solid minutes. Billy Graham was just simply obedient to the Lord. What God wanted to do, and he never deviated from that. And as Phillips reflects on Graham's life, he does so with the belief that Graham's work is not over. His ministry will not end because he's ministered to so many people. What he is, what's happened in their lives continues. R.C. Strickland tonight. Still ahead, we're going to talk to one of the men who welcomed the Reverend Graham to the city of Columbia. Well, many will remember Reverend Billy Graham speaking at the 1986 December commencement at the University of South Carolina. The university brought in several well-known religious figures in 86 and in 87, including the Pope. Patton Adams was the mayor of Columbia at the time and welcomed them to the city. He talked with our Stephen Dial. I had grown up uh, uh, hearing about Dr. Graham and my parents were great admirers of his and uh, he was very much a part of uh, the religious life of Columbia at the time. Patton Adams was the mayor of Columbia from 1986 to 1990. He welcomed Graham to Columbia during the crusade held at Williams Bryce Stadium in 1987. I cannot think of a more powerful religious leader in America in these times than Billy Graham. Uh, he has touched so many lives over so many generations. Uh, and I think that uh, his that is his legacy, that, uh, that he will uh, always be remembered as probably the greatest religious leader of our time in America. Adam says the year was a big ecumenical year for Columbia. Along with Graham, Pope John Paul II and the Archbishop of North and South America made trips here as well. He says he was in awe of how easy it was to talk to a person with Graham's status. I only had a few minutes to spend with him uh, before we went out on the field. But uh, those were very impressive moments with him. Um, and like I said, he just was so natural to talk with. Uh, uh, he sort of calmed me down a little bit and because I wasn't quite sure what to expect. The event was so large, the city put up banners to welcome Graham to Columbia. Adam says the banners caused some controversy leading up to the crusade. The ACLU didn't much like that. They thought that it was uh, uh, not in the spirit of the separation of church and state, uh, and so they you know, pretty much fussed about it. Despite the ACLU being against the banners, they stayed up in the city. Adam says he even saved one to give to Graham when they met. And I said, uh, you know, your, your presence here has uh, caused a great deal of interest in Columbia. Uh, and so have these banners, and I unfurled one and gave it to him. The crusade brought thousands from around the country to Williams Bryce Stadium. It's just very impressive the way the, the crusade committee had arranged it. 
because there were choirs from all over South Carolina there, young people there, uh, little children, uh, of course adults as well, but it involved the whole community. The crusade uh, committee wanted to involve the whole community. Adam says the best way to describe Graham was that he was a powerful leader in America, but he believes despite being a big celebrity, he never lost touch with the common person. You're seeing that here in Columbia, South Carolina, in this great football stadium at the university, there are hundreds of people that are making their commitment to Jesus Christ.